I want now to uh, present to you uh, this topic, uh, peace building and development. Very few uh, countries in Southeast Asia or universities in Southeast Asia actually do this topic. But in UK and in the US, you know, some of the universities are already introducing this uh, course as a course, as an independent course in itself. I'll also try to discuss, you know, to have a balance of both the theory and uh, again, telling you more stories so that you will feel that uh, in as much that you know, it is something, it is an academic course, you know, but then again, uh, the development of this course is really based on uh, what, uh, on our experiences, you know, lived experiences as researchers and why we feel it's important to come up with this academic course so that hopefully uh, more policymakers, more peace builders, more development workers, workers will take note that development in a situation an armed conflict is not the same development that we normally do at the state level you know all of our countries have a national development plan right like malaysia has its uh, five year uh, development plan philippines also have similar right uh, a five year development plan in all our countries so that is the kind of socio economic planning that all our governments do Okay, but in the context of an armed conflict, we know very well that you are trying to rehabilitate, okay, and reconstruct, you know, a, a place where you have had an experience of armed conflict. There, uh, not only that there is destruction of physical infrastructure, but more than that, you know, there are a lot of uh, dest destruction, you know, in terms of the economy, in terms of the social life of the people, uh, that includes health, education, and even relationships. You know? So we are looking both on the intangible and the tangible development uh, elements when we talk about development and peace building. So these are the debates or the critic, uh, the the critic on the issue of peace and development. A, B, C, D. Which among these choices are uh, most relevant to you as a discussion? There is no right or wrong answer. Now, the reason why I put this up because these are the normal assumptions and understanding, you know, especially with uh, people who are involved in um, in peace in the work of peace processes and also development work. Whether uh, they are the main conflict parties themselves, whether they are civil society or whether they are. Uh, international actors coming over to our uh, countries and trying to help us resolve all these armed conflict. Okay, so it's a normal um, debate, you know. So some people say, uh, especially among the main uh, parties, conflict parties, you know, uh, in the past, uh, development, you know, in itself is really looked at uh, as a counterinsurgency strategy of the state, you know, for the rebel groups. Okay, let's say the MNLF and the MILF. And the reason why they look it at that way, because normally the government, the state, okay, would do peace negotiations. On the other hand, while they are doing peace negotiations, they are also doing a lot of development activities on the ground. With the understanding of the state that the root cause of the conflict is poverty. Okay, so they, uh, in as much that they say, okay, let's buy time, let's negotiate with them. But hopefully, while we are doing and pour, uh, doing development and pouring a lot of money uh, in southern Thailand, in Mindanao, or in Aceh, you know, there is that hope that maybe that will weaken the the rebel groups, the insurgency. So that's why there is this idea by non-state actor groups that development is equals to uh, in, as an counterinsurgency strategy of the state. Okay. Interestingly, during the time of the peace uh, process between the MILF and the government of the Philippines, you know, they everybody is shocked to know that the MILF actually welcomed development. Although the peace negotiation is not yet finished, you know, they 
they actually welcome development and they said you know uh, we do not look at, at uh, look at it as a counterinsurgency because we look at the the root cause of the conflict to be something else not poverty okay that to them poverty is not that we are not uh, rebelling uh, we did not form ourselves as a non-state actor group because we are poor that is not the root cause of the conflict okay it, it's beyond that in the context of working uh, development workers and donor agencies working in armed conflict situations uh, it's but normal that uh, organizations like world bank you know they focus on socio economic development because that is really where they can see you know the progress I mean, when you deal with quantitative uh, indicators, you know, the numbers, GDP, you know, uh, how many uh, have we decreased mortality rate? Uh, are we educating more children and more people? So to, what you can count, okay, uh, according to the economists is something that to them is the peace dividends, okay? But then the other side of the coin, as we will find out later, uh, doing post uh, peace and development, if you want to have sustainable peace, you need to do development in a way that will support your peace process. You do not want to do development that will further escalate more conflict. Because when you do development, naturally you will have gainers and losers okay with the economy so that is not what you want to achieve you want a development that will make everybody win okay but is that possible to make everybody win in uh, a post-conflict development or post-agreement phase uh, there are three things that i want to uh, uh, to be focused on first is the, how does development work in a conflict situation and then secondly hopefully we can together rethink and reimagine what does development mean how does this work in a post agreement situation now i write here a term that maybe some of you are familiar with post agreement situation this is something that is actually uh, a result of the milf uh, panels you know in their negotiation with the government of the philippines you know in the past uh, organizations outside you know uh, especially the swiss um, uh, the swedish rather who have been promoting uh, security uh, ddr okay security frameworks like ddr ddr means demobilization demilitarization and rehabilitation so the idea that once non-state after group signs a peace agreement then they will do a ddr process Okay. So during the time of the negotiations between the MLF and the government of the Philippines, to them, it's not only about DDR. Okay, it's more than that. You know, it's about uh, implementing the the peace agreement itself. So that's why they coined the term post agreement situations. As compared to Ache, where the Gracan Ache Merdeka has gone through a DDR process. It's not only DDR. While in as much that you, yes, you take down the ammunitions from the ninth state actor group, it does not guarantee, you know, that there will be um, a management, you know, or there will be no more propensity to the use of uh, violence, you know, by other groups. So you also need security sector reforms on the other hand. So this is where the difference comes in in this Bangsamoro process because they are looking at, looking at the issue in a more comprehensive manner. They want to look at development as part of post-agreement situation. So that includes everything that has been agreed upon, including DDR and other security sector reform. So when we talk about development uh, studies, uh, there are concepts and approaches that you would often read you know, terms like sustainable human development which has been popularized by the UNDP in 2004 uh, human development concept or approach has been um, introduced by Mabub Olhak and Amartya Sen and the Japanese uh, Madame Ogata was also the one who was uh, key in, in introducing this human development concept the reason why UN uh, introduce the human development concept precisely because they they look at all the 
the situations of uh, development in, in a lot of countries, in a lot of states, and especially with, uh, with armed conflict situations. Okay, uh, What they often see is that there is more focus on socio purely socioeconomic development intervention, when in fact, human development entails beyond that. Okay, there are more to social socioeconomic development. Another term that you might also be familiar with is sustainable development. So do not be confused with HD and sustainable development because I know that today when we use sustainable development, we actually refer to how is this development intervention um, uh, sustainable that means it can pay on its own you know in terms of investment that you can you know uh, you can invest now and then it will continue to uh, run on its own without having new investment investments in the future another but then uh, the reality is that when sustainable development was introduced during the the brazil uh, rio de janeiro conference it is really to focus on the environment so sustainable development definition is in fact closely related to environment. So the idea is that no development can be made sustainable if our home planet in itself, you know, our, the place where we are living, our ecosystem is not going to be uh, preserved. And instead, what we see is that the wanton destruction of all our develop of our natural resources, then that is why they introduced this approach of sustainable development. But uh, again, uh, do not be confused about human development, and sustainable development, because sustainable development is putting environment at the heart of development, but human development is putting humankind, you know, at the heart or center of development. So this is really the the larger picture of development. And then how about human security? This also entails not only uh, physical security, the state-centric security, but of, of, of course, it also involves uh, livelihoods or economic security, food security, and, and many more. So which are also parts of human development and sustainable development. Poverty reduction and elevation. Uh, I'm sure some of you are also familiar uh, with poverty reduction and elevation projects or programs, especially coming from the World Bank. You know, uh, when World Bank was first established, you know, the idea is really uh, to, to respond to the poverty, you know, everywhere in all parts of the world. You know, just like in the Philippines, when World Bank first came, you know, as soon as uh, the Americans left the country, then World Bank came in, you know, they observed that they need to improve the economic situation of the Filipinos. So they have this poverty reduction programs. Okay, and then later on, uh, and then together with that poverty reduction elevation programming by World Bank, then they also made use of this concept called community-driven development. The idea is that uh, while uh, poverty reduction is mostly a top-down approach. They also want more participation from the community. So they want to make sure that the communities themselves are participating in, in any poverty reduction or elevation programs. And then, of course, uh, many of the NGOs or the civil society groups also develop their own uh, intervention called community development and mobilization. So this is where a lot of the NGOs have been skilled you know, and capable in uh, mobilizing the communities because the idea of community development and mobilization is that oftentimes in our countries, especially in Southeast Asia, the state is very far away, especially from the rural areas. So you have no choice but to do uh, rural development and community development and mobilization among the civil society groups, you know, because there are many development um, uh, facilities or development initiatives that will not uh, benefit especially uh, the rural communities. Okay. Then uh, last concept or approach uh, is this participatory rural appraisal or participatory learning and action. This is actually a rural development uh, concept. Uh, this has really been popularized by Robert Chambers and during a conference in Kong Khan University in Thailand, then they continue to develop this PRAPLA. Uh, PRA the idea basically behind PRAPLA is that while we want to develop especially the rural communities, 
Okay, and we want the rural communities to be participants. They are not going to be mere recipients. We do not look at the communities as mere recipients or benefactors uh, or beneficiaries of development, but they are in, in itself, they are agents of development. So if we are to look at the communities as agents of development, then this is uh, one methodology that we can make use of, PRA, PLA, because we also have to assume that not all people okay, that we want to train for development, uh, they will not be able to follow uh, our own uh, learned or educated way of teaching, right? The, of course, when we go to our rural areas, they will not know these terms that are written in English, sustainable development, human development, human security. So whatever paradigm or framework we draw before in the blackboard or today in the whiteboard, you know, that is not something that is familiar to them, right? So if we really want to be effective in doing development and allowing them to participate in development, then there are many PRA, PLA methods. You know, there is a book produced, uh, you know, by several uh, NGOs and Robert Chambers where you actually uh, do all these tools. You know, uh, an example of these tools is a livelihood mapping or geographic uh, or resource mapping. The communities themselves identify what are the existing resources in the community. Like, do they have a supply of vegetables in their own uh, community, in their own kampong, in their own village? Or do they have the, their own supply of water? or they don't you know so that is what we call source mapping so they do their own source mapping their own historical mapping of how the community came to be a village to be known as a political unit as a village so these are the things that we uh, we tackle with when we talk about development uh, that is uh, not only uh, rural development, but national development and international development. Because the reality is that when we talk about development in a situation of armed conflict, you know, we will still be dealing with all these approaches and concepts in development. I want to shape my discussion of development in uh, the paradigm of a right to self-determination conflict, you know, as part of transformation. Uh, because if we are just going to do a business as usual type of development framework, when in reality you are going to a, 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 a situation where you have had an, a right to self-determination conflict, then there is no guarantee that you will have durable peace, you know. And the World Bank and uh, UN in itself, you know, uh, also emphasizes this, you know, in the World Bank a report of 2011, you know, finally they admitted, you know, that even after many years of um, uh, doing a peace agreement, five years later, there is always a tendency for the conflict to come back. You know, for violence to come back in in that uh, area, you know, and, and some of these happen in Balkan areas and other parts of of, of Europe and other uh, places. So uh, now, if we want to um, to have durable peace, then we have to be more, more comprehensive uh, about. Uh, pushing for or, or using a development framework. So this is where I make use of development as part of conflict transformation. There are two case studies that I want to briefly explain to you. This is the map of the Philippines and uh, the Bangsamoro areas. This is now the map of Aceh. You know, it's at the tip of this big Sumatra island. Uh, they've been at war, you know, with the colonizers and then eventually with the new state, you know, the new state of Indonesia. Uh, despite that they are already part of the Indonesian uh, state, you know, they also continue to have a conflict with the state of Indonesia precisely because they want to determine their own future. You know, similar to Bangsamoro. It's also a good uh, example of a right to self-determination or identity conflict. And just a picture there of the peace agreement or the MOU Helsinki in 2005 uh, between GAM and the state of Aceh. In the past, there are also female combatants from the Grakan Aceh Merdeka. Okay, so if 
if we look at the peace process in Aceh, you know, it it is uh, facilitated okay, by the, in the beginning, uh, it was facilitated by HDC, by the Henry Dunant Center, okay, but that has not led to any success because uh, HDC is an uh, international organization, so it was, in a way, did not, they did not have enough political clout or political power to to get uh, both the government of Indonesia and GAM, you know, to adhere to what has been uh, in the peace process, what they have agreed in the peace process. So it was a weak peace process. And as many of you know, it was only soon after the tsunami, 2004, then uh, that finally the, the peace process uh, between GAM and GOI really prospered. Okay, and then that peace process was mediated by crisis management initiative, okay, that is based in Helsinki. And some of the infrastructure for peace, you know, under this peace process, they also had a joint security uh, commission uh, in the beginning, you know, uh, during the HDC time, this was their peace keeping mission, the Joint Security uh, uh, Commission or Committee in 2003 that was participated by Thailand and Philippines. Okay, And then with the CMI mediated peace process, then finally there was a full-blown ACHE monitoring mission or, or AMM in 2005, also participated by Thailand and Philippines and together with a big um, constituency from the European Union. And then finally, as a result of that uh, Helsinki MOU, you now have a new provincial government of Aceh. Okay, but not to forget in any peace process, you know, as just like we want to emphasize, how about the peace building? Peace processes are top-down approaches. So where do civil society uh, people uh, participate in the peace process? So we participate uh, in the peace building. So some of the peace building uh, platforms or activities have really been uh, organized by uh, diaspora of Achenese, you know, those living outside of Aceh, maybe they're based in Jakarta, or maybe they are based in Europe, or maybe they are based in Malaysia and many other countries. So these are some of the good examples of the peace building platform, you know, and it's so important that we also, uh, you know, identify these sources of peace, this peace building platform, because while the peace process is more uh, organized, you know, it's something that is more tangible, we can often see it. But uh, that kind of peace process is often, you know, a very fragile. Okay, so this is where the peace building um, activities come in to help and push, you know, and maintain the peace process without all these peace building activities by all these peace building actors, then the peace process will just be left to the decision of the main conflict parties. There are days when both parties just don't want to have any more peace negotiation at all. They wake up suddenly and they are fed up with each other. So what we you know what to do, you know, in reality, they both affect you know the lives and and um and the future of more people other than the uh, negotiators themselves so that's why it's so important to emphasize on peace building by civil society groups looking back to the bangsamoro uh, polit the politics of development in the bangsamoro region okay so for a certain uh, during a certain uh, period as i mentioned you know there was really a tug of war between uh, government and mi life and civil society organizations because the government the philippine government of course they had a tendency to make use of development as a counterinsurgency program i put there um, an article or a link for this book on soldiers as peacemakers and peace uh, peace builders uh, you can download that book and it will tell you that uh, the, to at some point the the philippine military also engage in community development when in reality what they do in the community is not merely to do all these small small development projects with the community community like an example to put up a source of water or to repair infrastructure but they are actually there to get information that's a very fine line you know of you know of, of uh, doing peace building to the military to them it's a peace building and a development work that they do but at the other on the other side the reality is that they are actually doing something that is more harmful to the community why is it harmful because in a way you are trying to take over 
the work of development workers and the work of the local government uh, leaders who are supposed to be the one doing the development activities in these conflict affected communities so finally with all these debates you know that we are also following you know the first slide earlier uh, it was the world bank uh, who uh, initiated this research okay it is not just to qualify it is not the world bank uh, who who uh, who came up you know with this uh, assertion that there, the reason there is armed conflict in the bangsamoro in mindanao because there is injustice this is not something new okay uh, people in the bangsamoro region especially the mi11 and all civil society groups have already been saying this out loud they have been screaming at the top of their voices that we are poor uh, we we have an armed conflict not because we, we are poor but because there is injustice precisely you have as an identity conflict okay that injustice the core of the conflict is really injustice in all aspects not only in social economic development but of course in terms of politics of development even if we shout at the top of our lungs you know it doesn't make any difference it has to be published by the world bank you know, so that more uh, govern uh, more international actors and the government you know it, itself will finally believe that it is injustice that is the root cause of the conflict so this is again where you know you have all these um, politics in development we have had two peace tracks because the two peace tracks the first peace track or peace process was with the mnlf until they they started in 1974 until they signed in 1996 so we learned a lot of lessons from that peace process okay you know all the uh, the mistakes you know the MILF negotiators learned from all those mistakes you know of course there was a denial you know uh, after the MNLF signed the peace process you know and government already implemented the peace process you know uh, there is uh, you know there is still some denial at that point that you know there is already a peace agreement so everything has been fulfilled you know when in reality there is still an armed conflict in the Bangsamoro region and when you talk about the peace infrastructure okay the way that they decided on who is going to do what in terms of post agreement phase or post conflict development okay that work has been mainly uh, been assigned to this mindanao economic development council or medco which is based in davao city which is not based in the armed conflict area while you have a autonomous region in muslim mindanao supposedly the autonomous region doing the development but most of the resources still had to be decided by medco so medco was like the little national government if the national government is based in manila you have medco based in mindanao who is really in charge of the affairs of the development in the autonomous region in this region in muslim mindanao then it comes to donor agencies okay so the un uh, came up with this un multi-donor program and they came up with this act for peace program now let's compare it to the mlf peace process okay that started in 2001 uh that I put there uh, the peace process with the MLF actually started as soon as 1976, but it was in 2001 that they had that the peace process was mediated by Malaysia. So this is where I will focus uh, the Malaysian facilitation. So throughout the peace process with Malaysian facilitation, they were able to come up with a Bangsamoro Development Agency. For the first time, if you compare and you study other peace processes only in the MILF peace process, can you see that they have not yet signed a peace agreement? They only signed a peace agreement in 2012, 2014. But as soon as 2002, they already agreed that they will come up with a BDA, uh, with this BDA. And this is going to be the MILF development arm. Okay. It's a non-state actor group, but they are allowing the MILF to come up with their own agency. Okay, not uh, not to independently do their development work. Okay, but at least they will be leading and helping in the, in deciding how do they go about in doing the reconstruction and rehabilitation in the Bangsamoro conflict affected areas. So that this BDA is really an important entity. 
Okay, another result of the peace process is they also came up with this Bangsamoro Management and Leadership Institute 2012. Okay, the reason why they have to come up with this one because they were already um, uh, planning ahead, you know, by that time they were already confident that uh, eventually the MILF people will be taking the, uh, the reins of power in the barn. Okay, so for them to be prepared, you know, from combatants to become um, administrators in the new autonomous uh, government, then they have to start training themselves, not only the top leaderships, but also the combatants, the fighters themselves. So this is really, you know, um, a, a very good development as compared to the MNLF, because in the past, the MNLF fighters, you know, they, uh, through the UN multi-donor program and the MEDCO, you know, they try to transform the um, uh, fighters into uh, members of cooperative as part of their livelihood uh, capacity building. So they become part of this cooperative system. Okay, but we learned a lot of lessons that all this cooperative failed and there was a lot of corruption. Okay, so that is something that they want to improve in the MILF peace process. There are also other uh, infrastructure related to peace and uh, development uh, that have been done through the International Monitoring Team or the IMT. This is a peacekeeping team, right? But then even in the mandate of the IMT, they actually included socioeconomic monitoring team. Uh, socioeconomic monitoring. So while the IMT was established or was first deployed in 2004, it was only in 2008 that finally that socioeconomic monitoring part of the IMT went into operation. So it was through JICA or the Japan International Cooperation Agency. They assigned a one or two persons, you know, I became two persons later on so that they can now uh, do activities related to socioeconomic development on the ground where there are conflict affected communities. And then of course, World Bank also, instead of UN, it was World Bank who constituted a multi-donor program and the World Bank this time around as compared to the MNLF uh, Med Medco worked supposedly with uh, the ARMM and UN multi-donor program worked also with the ARMM but in reality ARMM had very little political power you know in terms of the peace and development work so as compared to the to the MILF, World Bank worked closely with the BDA, you know, in um, uh, in organizing and, and planning. You know, they also come up with a Bangsamoro development plan for the MILF peace process. So what do we learn from uh, the MNLF and the uh, the GAM um, uh, post conflict or post conflict development institution? Okay. At the top is the post-conflict institution in, in Aceh, the BRR or the Badan Rehabilitasi. This is the, the rehabilitation um, a super body for post-conflict uh, in, in Aceh. The, the fact is, uh, it is unfortunate that uh, Aceh had a, a double whammy of disaster. You know? uh, they had a tsunami. At the same time, they had a conflict. So that's why it, it's but normal that both government and the donor agencies were trying to tackle both, you know, post-conflict development and post-tsunami development. Okay, so they were really burdened with trying to do uh, both, you know. And BRR was working directly with the kampongs or the village, uh, village levels in the Aceh uh, for the community development. Okay, for MNLF, you know, with uh, the Act for Peace program organized by the United Nations, okay, they have this program, but that program has really been mainly um, uh, decided or, or, um, or run by MEDCO or MINDA. Okay. MINDA is the, the newer name for this MEDCO. So eventually this MEDCO became a development authority. Okay, so while IARMM is also part of it. If you notice, you know, it comes to decision making, it is really um, the decision making really is uh, residing, you know, with the donor agencies and to some extent with Medco and Minda, which is a national government agency. And it's like only an afterthought that ARMM, you know, comes, uh, comes in and become part of this development plan and activities.
this is the Act for Peace program. If you are a development um, studies person, you will be familiar with these things, you know. Uh, so when we do development, you know, we, we do first social preparation. We do community participation, community planning, uh, planning, and then to, to do implementation, and then to strengthen the implementation. So these are the normal uh, development, uh, community development cycles or uh, stages that we do. In, in development. So the same manner that uh, in the Act for Peace, they also did this and uh, they really helped the MILF communities become part of all these development stages. They were successful because from fighters, you know, suddenly they become agents of their own development. So, you know, we have to be fair enough to say that this um, organization of peace and development communities in the MILF MNLF communities was successful. Okay. In itself, the communities become reliant. However, okay, the reality is that while the PDCs were successful on its own, the bigger picture is that you still have the conflict between the Bangsamoro people and the Philippine state. And you still have a lot of weaknesses when it comes to the political engagement. Okay. You might have people PDC is working by itself, but when you get out of the PDCs, the people, the communities will still be uh, facing the same obstacles of inequalities outside of the PDC. So it's like, you know, it's like um, uh, an incubated yeah, an, an incubated business. So I call the PDCs like an incubate, uh, incubated business. But once you are out there in the global economy, then you cannot really um, have a better survival rate. So that is the weakness really of the PDCs under the Act for Peace program. How about the BRA or uh, Bureau of Reintegration? Yes, this is the English translation of HSBRR, so BRA. Uh, what was interesting about this BRA is uh, I find uh, in, in my uh, research that, you know, they were really more effective in, um, in giving more freedom okay, and increasing participation at the village level because at the village level, uh, the, the people, the Achenese people were really participating in, in uh, community development planning. And that is exactly what is now being submitted to the uh, provincial government and the provincial government carries out now or provides the resources so this is like this is a slight difference between the act for peace program or the pdcs as compared to this bra situation in the ache case okay comparing ache and bangsamoro in mindanao when it comes to development okay and the peace process so i uh, put here in a box in a red box you know those uh, differences or comparison that pertains to development Okay, so if you look at number two, three, four, five, six, and seven, okay, it is really here that uh, everything about, uh, you know, part and parcel of development uh, work has been spelled out in these uh, aspects. In the negotiations, okay, where they have, as I mentioned, um, uh, the the international community joining you know in activities in the peace process you know so they have been very uh, they are given um, you know the correct guide you know uh, by the peace uh, panels you know where they can invest in terms of development or post agreement phase okay and of course you have the BDA and the BDA eventually came up with their Bangsamora development plan and today uh, apart from the BDA development plan now there is a Farm development plan. So you can say that from the BDA plan of 2015, although they were not really able to implement it because suddenly they were able to sign a peace agreement and then you already have a new government farm, but at least it was like a, a practice, an exercise for the MILF. You know, how do you actually do development planning? Because at that time, well, there is already the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, ARMM, and of course, the ARMM also has its own economic planning unit. Of course, there is animosity, you know, the don't see eye to eye because eventually ARMM has to come down. Uh, uh, there was so much uh, criticism by uh, against each other. And of course, ARM people who know about development planning, they will not easily want to work with BDA, you know, the MILF arm to help them with development planning. 
So it, in a way, the bid aid plan of 2015 was like a practice in exercise. And eventually, when BARM came into power, then they come up again with the new BARM development plan. Okay, and then I also mentioned in the normalization that it's not only about DDR, but it also includes rehabilitation of combatants and families, and even the rehabilitation of uh, identified uh, camps, MILF camps. Okay, so this is where the uh, development and reconstruction also comes again. And then in the comprehensive agreement itself, or number six, you know, in the CAB, okay, development planning okay, is, uh, is um, specified that the power of development planning rests on BARM. So compared to the ARM, uh, development planning was still a national activity, a national government entity. Okay, so while ARMM is already supposed to be an autonomous government, but, you know, a lot of it, maybe 90% of the decision still has to come from the national government. So this is something that is different now with the MILF or with the BARM uh, negotiated uh, agreement where there is total devolution of power of development planning. Okay, and then lastly and most importantly, commitment of resources. Again, the weakness before of ARMM was that 90% of the resources have to come from the national government. So it's always a joke, a banter of discussion among people then that, you know, ARMM politicians and MNLF always have to fly to Manila to be begging for the purse of the national government. So that is one very good lesson learned for the MILF panel, they do not want to be begging for money anymore. So BARM, uh, in the peace agreement, in the CAB, you know, it really specifies there how much percent of the national government um, uh, income will go to BARM at a certain number of period, you know, and the, the commitment of money of funding is really there, you know, in terms of block grants and national share of funds. Okay, remember, money is so important because uh, there, in the past, there is, of course, uh, an argument. You know, other local government units or other uh, um, provinces in, in Philippines, you know, it's but normal that they will complain. Why will BARM now get more money as compared to us? You know, then you are making it unequal. You know, why do they deserve? But what they re don't realize is that for, for so many years, you know, ever since the Philippine state, came into power, you know, the resources or the, the amount of money spent on, on the Muslim areas as compared to the non-Muslim area, it's like um, the government, the state is only spending like 30%. I think what in economics, this is what you call per capita, like the expenditure. How much will a person from BARM get? You know, as compared to somebody who is outside of BARM. So a person who lives in BARM will only get 30% um, benefit in terms of uh, economic development from the state government as compared to somebody who lives outside of BARM. Another important lesson, if you want to, uh, you know, see for yourself, you know, the, the assessment of the post-conflict uh, programming in Aceh. This is a very good resource material. Okay, so uh, as a result of this MSR published in 2009, you know, it's very clear that there were gaps in the post-conflict development uh, in Aceh, and you know, precisely because uh, there was an overlapping of the work between post-tsunami development and post-conflict recovery. So that is the, the weakness of the post-agreement uh, in, in Aceh's uh, case. What do we learn now? from the MNLF process for the MILF process. You know, the time that I was writing my thesis, you know, the government of the Philippines and the MLF, they were still negotiating about what powers can be, be uh, are to be shared and what are their sole powers, you know, in the CAB. So uh, I had the, you know, the benefit of discussing with some of the MILF uh, negotiators. So it was then uh, that time that I was advocating already that and checking with them, are you putting development planning, you know, in, in, in the agreement? Because if you don't specify it, then there's no point. We will be have experiencing the same thing that we experienced with the MNLF because development planning still rests on the national government. So fortunately, that right to development planning is already in that camp. 
One, uh, one link I also shared with you, there is a very good uh, empirical uh, paper done by Nazamuddin, who is an economist and used to be part of BRA, I think. And, uh, Dr. Nazamuddin, yeah, he wrote this uh, good uh, economic uh, analysis about uh, was there you know he 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 cal uh, he collected the data the economic data before the tsunami happened in not only in Aceh but in the three other places in Indonesia and then he collected again the economic data after this post tsunami and post conflict and his finding in that journal article is that there is not actually there is very little difference or improvement no, which is very interesting for for some of you who might want to go into this type of quantitative research. No. This is where uh, I'd like to share with you, you know, um, how complex and how difficult you know, is a peace, a post agreement phase. Okay. In spite that in this peace process, will you have an exit agreement? Okay. With the ideal that situation that everything will be implemented, you know, after this post agreement phase. But let us, you know, uh, remember that BPA, okay, is the, uh, is a government entity. It's a new government entity as a result of the peace agreement. On the other side, you still have the peace agreement, the CAB and the FAB. Okay. Not everything in the CAB and the FAB has been put into law so that it can be implemented through the BTA or the BARN. In the agreement, it says that uh, there will be a police commission in the BARN, but then uh, the parliamentarians in Manila, they said there can never be another uh, autonomous police commission. It has to be national. Then, then you know, and then, it, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. But then they were able to find creative means that, okay, you will now have recruitment in uh, the BARM. You will have the national government will try harder to recruit more Bangsamora people to be part of poli the police commission. Why is that important? Remember, the armed conflict happened because because of human rights abuses, okay? And then all these uh, social cultural uh, stereotypes, okay? Before, you know, in our history, uh, you know, the Filipinos in Manila, uh, you know, have this, uh, they are familiar with the slogan, uh, a good morrow is a dead morrow. Okay, so to them, you know, the morals, you know, they 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 have to be feared because they are looked at to be violent people. Okay, so there is that stereotyping and all this negative uh, image of the moral people. So naturally, when human rights abuses by the state, by the police, by the military, it is something that maybe people from Manila you know, uh, don't really make a big deal about it because it's so far away from them. But the people in Mindanao, uh, um, those who are closer to the conflict, of course, it's a big deal to them. Another part is the normalization. Okay, The normalization, unfortunately, while it is good on paper, uh, the Philippine government as the other party to the agreement, they are still also, they have yet really to fully implement, you know, uh, the normalization. And of course, uh, one very important difficulty for the Philippine government is the disbanding of private armed groups. Okay, political uh, families. You know, only in the Philippines do we have many political uh, uh, dynasties. Meaning, one family can actually hold power. They can be the mayor, the congressman, the president. The uh, monopoly of owning weapons and ammunitions is not only with the non-state armed groups but also with other you know bigger groups then there is always a tendency to the use of force to the use of armed violence so what's going to be like you know with this uh peace agreement post agreement i actually think that uh the exit agreement will take some time okay even after 2025 okay we may have the election finally there will now be a transition uh, the MI left finally contesting fairly in an election whether they are still on power or not you know that is what we want to see because that is democracy at work okay but on the other side it's no not only about mom you still have the cab that needs to be implemented 
So I don't think by 2025, a lot of the things in CAB will have been implemented. So it's still, you know, it will take a longer phase. But anyhow, there are already a lot of improvements you know, over the years with this MILF peace process as compared to the MNLF. But durable peace, it's really, you know, a long-term commitment. Okay, so it will take time. And then we also have to be realistic about you know uh, how this peace process can really be fulfilled the pillar of my uh, work is you know on this human development concept or approach you know which has been uh, early on has been developed by amartya sen so since it is a right to self determination conflict you know it is so important that that rsd as a ba as a fundamental right you know also uh, will be translated you know in in post-conflict uh, development or post-agreement phase. So how much of that RSD can now be uh, also uh, reflected in, in development? RSD in itself is a fundamental human right. Okay, So if we uh, are able to implement RSD, then uh, development should be uh, something that is also very much part of our RSD um, um, RSD uh, motives or RSD mission. Okay, and then if we define uh, what is uh, human development, okay, basically this is the definition of human development, the process of enlarging people's choices and enhancing human capabilities, okay, to have all these freedoms and then three aspects you know uh live a uh, long and healthy life okay so basic right to life and uh, social uh the social life of the people have access to knowledge and decent standard of living and then participate in the life of their of the community and decisions affecting their life so this is where the political uh, freedom comes in so that's why i took this uh, human development as really the core of my development framework because if we do not have these freedoms this human development uh, freedoms, then uh, how can we say in the future that we are really able to fulfill the right to self-determination? Uh, these are MILF communities. So again, when you talk about non-state actor groups, okay, you are not talking about just combatants or fighters living in a certain territory. You are, just like in any other conflict situations in the region, you are talking about communities. Okay, you have MILF communities, you have their the whole family, including children. So they mostly live in this, you know, hard to reach rural areas. And of course, as a development uh, practitioner and a researcher, uh, that's why PRA, PLA also encourages uh, researchers and practitioners that you do not only treat the communities or your respondents as subjects of your research, but you engage them and, and, uh, help them you know in doing their own community planning and then hopefully you will also invest in their own community planning what does human development means okay so if uh the the purpose of development is to enlarge people's choices okay so that we, everybody will have equal opportunities okay not only those that have but also those that do not have okay that is what we want the kind of development that we want so these are the sustainable human development areas and indicators. Okay, so if you look at the human development uh, HDI or the human development index, these are the three areas that they measure. Okay, so these are the measurable areas. Okay, while uh, it is true that the human development com uh, development concept is comprehensive, it goes beyond what we can count. Okay. It also uh, discusses about climate change, about environment, and about the political uh, relationship, you know, by the state and then uh, and also the sub-state. Okay, okay. Uh, but then uh, HDI or the Human Development Concept really became, um, in a way, attractive and controversial to all the states the minute that hdi was introduced because norm because of course the minute that you have the hdi or the human development index then you are ranked you know where what is the ranking of indonesia are you ranked in the if, let's say there are 200 states you know are you ranked uh, in, in in the top 100 or are you ranked in the bottom 200 okay so this is how the economist 
like a Martin Sen and Mabug Ulhag and Ogata, you know, try to encourage everybody to look at this human development approach. So the minute that you have the HDI, then suddenly states and politicians become more interested in understanding the human development approach. So what is the relevance of human development in the context of the RST? You know, why did I choose it? And because if we are saying that human development is really a comprehensive development, it's all about the capacities and uh, you know uh, uh, the resources that can be uh, given to a community. Okay, that is exactly what we want to happen. Uh, what the people or the communities in a right to self determination conflict or those that are experiencing an identity conflict, those are the same things that they want. Those are the, the basic needs that they want for themselves, you know, for their communities. If you look at the uh, the paradigm of sustainable human development, you know, with the definition that you want to develop the full potentials of the communities, you know, with all the resources and all the different aspects of development, in the same manner in peace building, okay, we talk about structural peace. Okay, remember in structural peace, it's again, it's all about capabilities and freedoms and human rights. Okay, so. This is where both human development and peace building actually intersect. Okay? Both are referred to right to self-determination, which is very fundamental. Okay? You want uh, any community, any individual, of course, they want to, to develop themselves to make sure that they experience their development potential. So this is where you have their intersection between human development and peace building. And then uh, we are assuming or I'm assuming that this is really the ingredient for us to have sustainable peace or durable peace and the two frameworks uh, they are actually reinforcing each other no framework is higher than the other and you know, they are not contesting frameworks okay so if you look at the at the top level you know i i plot there what happens in a peace process okay so, of course, the first uh, uh, event or phase of the peace process is that, let's say you have an armed conflict, you want right away to have a ceasefire, you want to have a halt or a cessation of hostilities, and that is where you come in, where you have peacekeepers or peace monitoring coming in in the area. And then only then, if you have a, a management of the armed conflict, can you do peacemaking. But of course, in reality, uh, even in Bangsamoro, while they are doing the peacemaking, the, um, the peace process and peace negotiation is ongoing that doesn't mean that there are no more uh, cease uh, there are no more armed conflict that has ha been happening in fact you know conflicts armed conflicts and violations to the ceasefire agreement continues to happen so this is when the third party peacekeeping comes in in the past peacekeeping was only done by both parties both the government and the MILF came up with their own uh, peacekeepers but then as we could see the civil as the civil society in Mindanao could uh, witness you know they are not really responsible for their actions you know so they just brush it off when they violate each other ceasefire agreement and then eventually there is this initial reconstruction and rehabilitation and development you know led by the BDA the reason they had to do this because in 2000 in year 2000 there was an all out war in the MILF areas you know the philippine state while negotiating the next day president uh, Joseph Estrada, our movie actor president, just woke up in the morning and suddenly they said, he said, upon finding out where the MILF camps are located, he told uh, his military that, okay, we now attack all the MILF uh, camps since we now know uh, where they are. So then we had the all-out war of 2000, which happened within a nine-month period and which was really a bad thing for us to experience before Marawi even happened. Okay, so, and then if you have a peacemaking, a peace agreement, then supposedly you will now have post-conflict development or what we call post-agreement phase. And then only then can you achieve reconciliation as part of the work of the TGRC or the Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation uh, Commission. Okay, so when we look at 
you know, how do we measure? How do we work for human development? Again, we look at the human development index and all these human development indicators. Okay. And then we put also uh, peace building, okay, the peace building paradigm. How do we ensure that this human development will actually promote peace and that will not bring us back to more inequality and to more uh, conflict, you know, between communities, okay? So this is where I propose that these are the exact and the very specific peace building strategy, strategies that should be employed together in doing development work or development um, implementation in the Bangsamoro. Because if we are able to do human development and peace building, then that in itself is already a fulfillment of that right to self-determination aspirations of the Bangsamoro people. So just to show that, you know, you want a comprehensive development, not only political development, not only in the peace agreement, the new uh, state and sub-state arrangement between BARM and the national government, but you want development planning in all aspects in security sector reform, the environment, social aspects, culture, religion, economy. And then, of course, you need for us to be able to do this, you need a change in institutions. You need institutional building and a new governance system. So hopefully, although there is now a new BARM, okay, this new Bangsamoro Transition Authority, they are now doing this new laws in the parliament so that they can slowly build all these new institutions that will fulfill all these other development areas. Okay, but hopefully they will also not forget that even though they are doing development in all these areas, they should be aware and conscious that they uh, a strategy is always to do all these peace building strategies. You know? Otherwise, we don't want to be in a situation that you now have you know the Bangsamoro people running their own government and affairs, but within the community or the territory territory itself, you know other groups may be oppressing other groups. So that is something that we do not want to happen anymore. So this is the website of the Bangsamoro Development Agency. So surprisingly, because the time when I finished my PhD work, you know, the BD, uh, MILF and the BDA were just starting to work with the World Bank. So they, uh, I asked them to invite me to present my, my electric fan model. And, you know, they, they bought it because I told them that, you know, you are now working with World Bank and other donor agencies. If you do not have an idea of what framework of development you want to do, you might as well take my electric fund model so that you will be guided. I'm not in inventing anything new, but at least you will be guided that, look, you need a comprehensive development and hopefully along the way, you are also applying peace building strategy. So in conclusion, development philosophy or framework approach is really a very important you know, part of political peace negotiation. You know, it's often that we hear that, you know, that development can come later. Okay, but then I insisted with the peace panel of a member of MILF, it cannot be later, it has to be now. Because if it's not in the peace agreement, then you will have more problems later on. So it cannot be an afterthought or a second priority. During the post agreement, it is development that will sustain the support to peace making if people on the ground they are unhappy just like with the uh, Ache, uh, Gerakan Ache Merdeka fighters uh, they only enumerated like 2,000 uh, fighters or a certain number of fighters but there were more fighters in fact the female part uh, fighters did not also benefit from that economic package you know from uh, BRA and, uh, and BRR so you will have you know continuous um, uh, unhappiness among the people in the conflict affected communities and that to provide uh, peace dividends and show the indicators of a successful peace process so this is where again uh, empirical or measuring you know coming up with a measuring device is so important as of now uh, the BARM and the MILF still do not have a measuring device uh, in terms of, you know, the impact the, uh, of the new uh, BARM. Uh, what they are using as a measuring or a guide uh, in the peace process is really the, the, the listing that they have in the CAB or the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro. So that remains to be their device for measuring the process. 
And then, however, as observed in the Aceh and Bangsamora peace process, more energies are focused on running a new government. A new government, yes, it is. Uh, um, it, it is one result of the peace agreement, but you still have a separate, uh, you still have uh, the peace agreement and many of those things need to be implemented, okay, and apart, implemented separate from the, from the government, you know, especially those dealing with the relationship between the new government and the national government. And then lastly, as a result, the work of conflict transformation and peace building cannot be left behind rather. So here, uh, what I'm saying is that development in itself has its transformative role. If we are able uh, to push, you know, uh, a framework that will really address the conflict, uh, the armed conflict situation. The values transformation is actually uh, equivalent to the social preparation that is being done by the World Bank when it comes to community-driven development. Okay, so in the beginning, yeah, I have to tell you that uh, the VTT, you know, came about because um, you know when BDA when BDA was established, of course, uh, they are aware that whatever uh, development that you bring, how much ever money you pour in in the ARMM or in the Bangsamore areas, you know, it will end up as leakages, you know, in terms of corruption, okay? So, and then uh, because you want to change, you know, those who will work for development, especially within the ranks of MILF. So what they did is that they came up with this VTT with the idea that they will brainwash those people that will be working for BDA, they will be brainwashed, hopefully, that they will uphold, you know, uh, a, a, a corrupt-free uh, institution, you know, through the BDA. So that's why they did this values transformation program. And then, in fact, in the beginning, no donor agency wanted to invest on this VTT because they make use of Islamic um, uh, philosophy and Islamic um, a value system, you know, as part of that values transformation. So it is but natural that UN agencies and World Bank are thinking, are they, do they want to be like, are they building an Islamic community? An Islamic? And of course, they are so allergic about that. You know, knowing that MILF is central to the MILF ideology and philosophy is really the religion in Islam. They want to maintain, you know, and, and to develop their, you know, the their religion. You know, so not many people wanted to invest on VTT until, you know, um, it's not good to mention, but somebody, you know, instead, you know, a person invested on this VTT and that's how they started. Only after many years that finally upon discussion and seeing how this VTT works, did the World Bank finally uh, accept that VTT is actually uh, the counterpart of social preparation. So it's nothing to be feared about because just like in any religion, you want to teach your development workers, you know, the ethics in what is wrong and right and what is cor and how do you commit corruption and how do you make sure that you value the resources that you are given to your uh, the, um, the resources available that are given to you are part of your amana you know so you want to make sure that it is spent that, that it will be spent well about rsd politics yes uh, rsd politics uh, that's the reason uh, why i'm one of the few who continue uh, who wrote the term rsd and have it published you know so in that article i made a conscious effort that rsd is in the title because states normally fear the term rsv because rsd because they equate it to secession but as i argued in the article you know it's it's really about trying to understand what this RSD means to these people you know what they really just want is that for them to have this development you know, the, the human development, the centrality uh, of human development in all aspects. You know, you have to understand that they live, they they want to live as Muslims, they want to live as Bangsamora people with the different ethnic groups. You know, they want to preserve, you know, their identity. So it is but natural that they make use of that right to self-determination framework. You know, since anyway, in the international law and in national law, you know, it's stated, you know, why not? You know, so uh, that's why in the article, you, you have to understand, you, you can, the more that you uh, enumerate it, identify it clearly, then it doesn't have to be something that is politically feared. 
So what I actually did is to deconstruct what does RSD mean, especially in the reality of the peace process and development. Another word that has also been transformed is the word, um, the word bangsamoro. Okay, bangsamoro or moros is a very negative word in the entire Philippines because of the history, you know, from the Spanish time to the American period. Even among my generation in the past in in year as soon as uh, 2000 uh, during the all out war we organized ups ourselves as young moro professionals network even amongst ourselves uh, there are people who do not want to use the term moro because it is it has a bad uh, meaning and connotation you know like barbaric and and violent and all that then but then um, we said to ourselves that this is an opportunity for us to turn around the meaning of that moro so in the same manner the minute that President Aquino, uh, before the signing of the peace agreement in 2012, um, or 2012, the framework of agreement, he was the one who used the term Moro in public television because they want to name the territory. Okay, where it, because the territory then is autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. Okay, and of course. The MILF and the Bangsamoro people want to put the word Moro, but of course there is so much opposition to the word. But fortunately, the President Aquino made use of that term. He said, we will call this area, this territory as Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao. So now, you know, Bangsamoro term has become a more positive or neutral, at least neutral term. So this is where transformation can be seen, a very good example of how conflict transformation can be seen in a peace process.